Good afternoon and welcome back to Journalism Media Week. I hope you've all uh, had a fantastic time this morning with the great sessions that we've had. We're now very, very fortunate to be joined by one of Britain's most loved commentators, uh, Connor McNamara. Connor, thanks very much for taking the time to join us today. I'll take that. I haven't had much loved before. That's our most loved. That's fantastic. I'll uh, I'll be putting that in my bio. <laughs> um, do you mind if we start at the beginning with a little bit about how you got into commentary? Yeah, sure. Um, I've always I've always loved sport, and I think um, like many people, you, you you reach a certain age where you're around nine or ten years of age where it dawns on you that that you may not be good enough to uh, to actually be a professional sports person, and that's not going to be how you make your career. Um, so I, I, it kind of just occurred to me, I don't know, I was just thinking, oh, commentary, that's how you could be involved in sport, that's how that could be your job, but uh, you know, you wouldn't have to rely on, on having big muscles or being able to run very fast or whatever. Um, and I always had a you know, strong background in, in media in my house. My dad was a sort of radio DJ on, uh, on RTE, which is like the Irish equivalent of BBC. And uh, so, like, yeah, we, we're always sort of into media in our house. So you kind of put those two things together and, uh, and it kind of veered me down that path. And then I did study sort of media stuff in college and, and very quickly started working in, in, in different radio stations and stuff. So, so from very early on, it was sort of, this was a route I would love to follow. It was very difficult to know where the path would lead. And there isn't sort of a set career path in this, but, but once you get in and then you see, all oh, right, there's that sort of opportunity, there's that sort of opportunity. Uh, and, and then you just go with the flow of what comes your way. So um, yeah, it, it's something that I had my eye on for a long time. And, and fortunately I was able to to plot a path and, and and take advantage of opportunities that came away. And you seem an incredibly flexible commentator in that you do more sports than pretty much any other sports commentator I'm aware of. How did that kind of come around where you ended up covering so many? Yeah, I think I think again as a kid I just I liked playing different sport. It wasn't that I, you know, was only interested in one sport or another. Um I grew up in Limerick, which is a very strong rugby union, sort of stronghold. It's very, it's kind of like Wales and New Zealand. You know, rugby is the the, the sport of the people, um, working class sport. You know, across all the levels in Limerick, and, and it's very popular sport. So I always would have been wanted to get into that. And then I suppose it's an example of how broadcasting. Um, landscape has changed in recent years that, that back then there actually wasn't that much rugby union um on the radio or on the television you obviously had big european games and six nations internationals but that's only a handful of of big games so there wasn't a great access route to to get in and and be a commentator you know starting out as a youngster um whereas i guess football has always been more widespread and there's always been more of it and therefore more commentators are needed so i think my, my early access route into sports commentary was through football which of course i was always a big massive big fan of but i think it's an important point to say and pe people always sort of ask me about that oh you must be a huge fan of sport a very important thing i would say if we're, if we're talking about the mechanics of of journalism and media and i know that's that, that's what your week is all about here for me you don't actually have to be a huge fan it, it's great to have enthusiasm it's great to have a love of the sport um but i think there's a fine line between when you show up to a game as a fan and when you show up to work as a commentator and i think getting that fine line correct is is something that that's often the difference between people who who sort of make it and don't and you, you also seem to have quite a range in that you obviously work quite a lot on the radio uh, for Five Live, but then do quite a bit of telly as well. I mean, is there a difference when you go into the game and you're covering it on radio and then when you're doing it on telly? Yeah, huge. I mean, it's, it's a completely different approach. And for obvious reasons, when you're on the radio, you are the eyes of the audience. You've got to describe what you see. And if you had that approach on television, you, you'd you be very off-putting to the viewer because they're like, you're saying the bleeding obvious. I can see this. Don't tell me what I can see. You've got to add to it. Um, so they are different disciplines. Um, I, I find it easy enough to do the, the transition. I think for me, it's it's like um, using a different part of your brain, which actually rests the, the first part of your brain, if you know what I mean. So I think if, if I was always doing just one of them, I think you'd get a bit more worn out a bit quicker rather than having that little transition. I mean, I always say like, if it's something like you've got, you know, hard study to do in college uh, and you're also training for a marathon, you can be tired from the marathon training, but then go home and be refreshed to do your, your 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 study for your exams and vice versa you, you could be a bit worn out from doing the exams but then you might want to go for a run so for me i think it's it's that sort of refreshing thing if i've had a long run of of doing maybe football on the radio but then i get to do a weekend of doing rugby on the tv it actually refreshes me in that way if, if that makes sense and does the type or level of preparation that you've got to do differ quite a lot from maybe covering the open to going and covering the premier league game is yeah. is there a 
Yeah, no, there certainly is. Yeah, I mean, the, the two examples you've given are good ones. Um, look, there's always a base level of preparation you need for anything. Um, the Open is a huge event with over 200 people taking part in it, spread over four days. It, it's very difficult to to do the prep. And it's also sort of not necessary in the way you would for football in terms of you need basic biographical things of of the players. But in reality, what you're doing is responding to what happens at the time. So what is the score right now? What does this player have to do? What is the task in front of them at the moment? That's the sort of golf commentary job. Um, there's a lot more context, I guess, when you're doing a football or rugby game. You're comparing to what happened last time. You're sort of, um, you know, you're, you're looking for patterns in what happens. Um, so it's a different amount of prep. I mean, I, I always say when people ask me, the easiest way to describe it is a, a prep for a game, you know, or a day's broadcasting, it takes a day. So if I've got three games to commentary in a week, I've got three days of prep to do. Now, that doesn't mean I sit down and do a nine to five. Um, I flew back from Paris this weekend and I spent time at the airport and then on the plane doing the bit of work. And if you're in the back of a taxi or you're on a train, you'll just put together hour after hour after hour of work, which then adds up to have been a, a, you know, the equivalent of a full day's work. Then sometimes you've got to burn the midnight oil and sometimes you'll stay up to two in the morning you know, just to get something finished or whatever. Um, but but doing that homework is is the key part to this job. It really is. You've got to deliver on the day, but you can only deliver on the day if you've done the prep. And you know, any time in the past where I've ended up for whatever reason at a game where I don't feel I've fully properly done the prep you do not enjoy that game you're you're on edge the whole time you're just a little bit of uncertainty in your voice and, and it comes across whereas when you know what you're doing and you're confident and I've got this that's when you'll have a, a really good game and that's when you enjoy it so so when I do the work it, it, it never really feels taxing from that point of view because I know that I will be the number one beneficiary if you like I mean you're obviously doing this to be accurate for your audience but the reason I'm doing the hours of my prep is so that I then enjoy the day of the game an awful lot more. And I know from uh, speaking to people who've worked with you in the past, when, when you're covering games, you'll also do some multimedia uh, that can potentially be used um, online. How do you think that's kind of changed in terms of how commentators work nowadays? Yeah, it's it's becoming it's becoming more and more of a thing. I mean, obviously, look, social media across across all industries has has become more sort of front and center. I think I think I think there's two ways of doing it. I think you, you you've got to first and foremost remember why you're there. If if you're you know if your job is to go and be a commentator of a game, that's the most important thing to get right. You know, and I think uh, sort of trappings that maybe young people might fall into is when they're starting out, they'll they'll be more worried about their photo on social media or their Facebook live hit they want to do or whatever, and and then they'll forget to do something for the main gig or they won't be as fully prepared as they should be. So I think I think. For me, it's always been an add-on. Um, it, it had, you know, I always feel, and, and this sounds a bit wishy-washy, but it's genuinely true. Is you know, we have this privileged position. We get to sit on the halfway line. We get to go to training grounds. We get to meet managers. We get to interview players. We get to stand pitch side. It's a great position that a lot of people want to be in. And, and I think for me and my social media stuff, I want to, I want to, to utilize that to harness that energy and say, look, you know, come in, be involved in my broadcast. This is this is the, the view I have. Um, and, and engage people in that way. And, and look, there's no doubt about it. Social media is, is a huge amount about promotion. I think, again, fine lines. I think some people go way too far the other way when it comes to self-promotion. You've got to be careful about that. Um, but it is promotion. You, know, you want to say, I'm at this game, and, and what you're doing is giving a nudge and a reminder to people that this game is on and that you can watch coverage of this game or you can listen to this game. Um, so, so in a sense, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to promote it, um, but also give, you know, enhance the coverage. So, you know, and I think we live in an era... And this, I guess, was em uh, emphasized a lot more during lockdown. But, you know, where a lot of coverage on a lot of channels, it's, it's a commentator just sitting in a studio, just looking at the same pictures as you. And, and, and they're adding to the coverage. Whereas, you know, I've been really lucky in my career. The broadcasters that I work for, they always send us to the game. So um, I do think there's an extra trust comes with that. So when the audience knows that you are there and you are seeing it for yourself, you're not just relying on a replay or a close up that you see in the screen, the same as the people at home, that you've got an extra view on this. Um, I think that adds to your trust, and trust is a huge part. You know, people listening to a game on the radio, you want to trust, is this guy telling me the truth? Is this guy really giving me what it is, or is he just kind of covering over what he can see? So so all those things added up. The social media part plays a, a very important role, um, and it enhances what the coverage is. But I go back to what I said at the very start is, remember, though, that it is that enhancement. Um, the, 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 the core element of why you're there is something else, and, and make sure you've got your priorities straight. If, if you've got everything done, Technically, lines are tested, prep is done, you're ready to go. Then, by all means, spend an hour doing social media. But don't spend the hour social media and then realize that your your connection isn't working and the people can't hear you back in the studio and stuff, which is sort of obvious, but I think needs to be said. And I know you, I know you just touched on there a bit about lockdown. 
what was it like going to games when you were going there and there's no fans for you to bounce off? Or, um, like you say, I'm, I'm guessing the Euros, you had to do a fair bit of that remotely. Yeah, it was it was it was terrible to be honest, and I think I think it's made me realise a lot of things, um, as I, as I'm sure it has f- for all of us. Um, I think before lockdown, I was probably working a little bit too hard. I was doing so much travel, and it had sort of become very normal to me. And if anything, in a funny way, I guess I would have wished this idea of oh god, I'd love a few months just sitting at home. Uh, but then it's funny when it happens how massively you miss being on the road and and doing things. Um, yeah, look, it, look, it was obviously a really weird spell, and it doesn't matter who you are. I think, I think, you know, we're all still in a bit post post traumatic syndrome about it because, um, you know, there was a time there where you're thinking, "Geez, are, are we ever going to work again? Is there ever going to be full stadiums? Are people ever going to congregate in large numbers ever again?" Um, so it's been great to, to come back, and, and not that I didn't appreciate it before, but I think there's an extra appreciation that you sort of go, "Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for this great opportunity that I get, and the the interesting places I go to travel to." Um, it, it was it was rubbish. I mean, look, look, don't be wrong. It, it, go back to what I said when you're worried you'll ever work again. You're very appreciative. Someone rings you up and say, will you go to the stadium and work in a game? And of course, you're delighted to do so. Um, but it, it was it was rubbish. The, 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 the atmosphere wasn't there. It felt like what it was, which was a contractual obligation. Um, the, the teams had to play the games. The television contracts had to be honored. I think the government were happy to have things sport, live sports and TV because that would encourage people to stay at home at a time when they wanted them to do so. Um, but the quality of the games weren't good. The atmosphere wasn't good. And you know, the best way I can describe it in terms of the difficulty of being a commentator, if, if you're in a stadium that's empty, it's it's you're a surfer on a wave. If it's a big, strong wave, you can surf on that wave and, and, and you can surf. If there's no wave, you, you stand up on the board, you will just sink. Um, and, and that's the best description. You know, if a crowd is very loud and a commentator's voice is to get up and be really excited, that sounds fine. If you're in an empty room and you do that, you just sound like a bit of a weirdo shouting for no reason, you know, so it, it, you got to get that stuff right. And then, yeah, I did do, and I'm looking forward to not to have had to do too much of it, but I did do some of the, what we call off tube commentaries where you're just watching on TV, one or two of them from home and then others from studios, just obviously when, when social distancing was a big uh, issue. And it's, it, it's difficult. It's, you are, you are, the equivalent I give it to you, you're driving a car, but you're only looking through a letterbox. So, yeah, if you drive really slowly and you're really careful, you take no risks, you, you should be OK. But, you know, it's fraught with danger. Something could could go wrong here. So that's how I would describe it. And for that reason, you don't enjoy it as much. But look, for, for what's been a really weird time, and I know an awful lot of people have had it way worse than, than football commentators. They'll be bottom of the list of people to have sympathies for. Um, but yeah, it was it was an unusual time. We got through it. Hopefully that's the end of it now. And we can we can sort of appreciate normal times a bit more. And what was it like the first time you went to either a big event or a big stadium afterwards and you kind of, was it relief when you got in and you kind of got back to how it was? Yeah, I mean, it was strange because it went on for so long. You, you you kind of got used to it after a while. Um, and certain things, don't get me wrong now, but certain things were great. Um, you know, just to give people an illustration, every ground is different. But when you arrive to a game and depending who you're working for and whatnot, you, you're your parking, for example, will be a different place. So sometimes you have to park in a car park 10 minutes walk away. Sometimes you get to drive right up to the door. Um, during lockdown, because there was no crowd, we could, you know, it was, it was like you're a player. We used to just drive in, you would park right next to the stadium, you'd walk in, and then you'd come out afterwards, you get your car and you'd drive away. And you're, you know, and and these, this might seem a really small thing, but, you know, when, you, when you're doing this three or four times a week, um, sitting in traffic for an hour or two each time, that, that's a huge difference. So um, that was one of the big things you noticed when the crowds came back was, oh, jeepers, I'm going to have to give myself more time here. I'm not going to get away as quick afterwards. Um, we've got to count in the, the traffic again. So it's stuff like that. But I do remember, I remember one of the first games. I was back doing was at Anfield and Liverpool had had that season where obviously they were brilliant and they went on to win the league but they'd done so much of it behind closed doors and I remember one of the one of these first games and fans were back in and it just was great it was it would make you smile and and even I remember going around doing little fist bumps with some of the stewards who worked there and the other media people and you know we'd all been in it was a bit like being on a space station in space and then suddenly we'd come back down to earth and there's people involved again it, it was just a really nice feeling um, and there's there's just no doubt. I mean, I was at Leeds on on, on yesterday, on Sunday yesterday, and um, the, the crowd, the noise at Elland Road was just brilliant. And, and as a commentator, that's what you want. It's it's the reaffirmation that this event means something to people, and that's why it's intriguing, and that's why people want to watch. And you add all those things together, that that is what we do. It's you know to convey that excitement. And when that excitement isn't there, it's just a completely different task. But it's it is great now having having the crowds back in, and it's you know it t- takes you longer to get to your seat, and there's queues for the toilets and all these kind of things. But but there's there's there's, there's no way you'd swap it. There's no way you'd go back. And just kind of going back through your career as a whole, what what do you think was the best moment 
you've commented mm. on, or the moment you've been sat there and gone, have I just actually seen this <laughs> happen in front of me? Yeah, look, I, I've been really, really lucky and I'm doing this such a long time and there's been so many and it is difficult to to, to pick out, you know, individual moments. But but I do remember, you know, that there are certain things in my head where you just feel, well, I'm, I'm going to remember this forever. And, and sometimes it's a it's a moment on a pitch and a goal, sometimes a piece of skill, sometimes it's just the actual event. I remember going to the World Cup in South Africa in 2010 and just feeling, this is brilliant. I'd never been to South Africa before. Um, traveling around the country and, and seeing the stadiums and seeing the football and just just really realizing what a wonderful opportunity, you know, to be paid to go and do this. It's fantastic. Um, same for World Cup in Brazil, which was, you know, one of those bucket list things I would have had throughout my career. Like, oh, I'd love to commentate on a World Cup in Brazil. Um, so that was amazing. And then and then there's just little moments. I remember doing uh, Germany at the World Cup in, in 2006, uh, and it was Brazil against France in a quarterfinal. And I remember just at the game and just these stellar names, you know, the likes of Thierry Henry and Patrick Vieira were at their pomp. And then you know the Brazil team with, with the old Ronaldo and Roberto Carlos and these guys. And they were just, you know, stellar famous names. And even before the game, just feeling, you know, you knew the, the entire planet is tuning in to watch this game. And there I am sitting on the halfway line commentating on it. And I remember once Zidane was doing these ridiculous flicks. And th- it, was the, it was the end of Zidane's career. And you might remember he got sent off in the final for a headbutt and all that. But um, back before that, had they lost this quarterfinal, that would have been his last game. And, and he went out and he absolutely turned on the style. And he was a huge reason why France won that game. And I remember just thinking, well, I, I've witnessed something special there. That That felt amazing. So you've got those kind of moments. And then... I mean, I remember doing the Miracle of Medina in golf in the Ryder Cup when Europe were miles behind on Saturday, this amazing comeback on a Sunday. And, and, you know, even regardless of the comeback, and that's what people remember, you know, how, how Europe won the event. But, you know, who cares who wins? It, just in terms of being there, that was the most amazing. The American golf fans are very annoying. They shout all this, get in the hole stuff, and they, 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 they drive you mad. But, but when there's tens of thousands of them and it's this sort of stadium golf and the wall of noise and, and you feel like you're at Wembley Stadium, but it's for golf. Um, that was incredible. And, and and the access we get there is different. You know, football and rugby, we sit in the stands and we've you know, a great view of the halfway line. But but in golf, we're on course. I mean, we've got mobile headphones and, and, and microphones. We are walking on the course. We, we get to kneel down on the edge of the green. You know, you, you, you if you're a billionaire, you cannot buy a ticket that allows you th- that sort of access. I remember there was a part three at Medina and I was following Tiger Woods' group. And again, that, that was when Tiger Woods was famous, famous Tiger Woods. And and he had this brilliant shot, tee shot that landed right in the green. And I'm walking down to the green alongside him. And there's this like tunnel of spectators, you know, that the stewards have made this tunnel so they can walk through, the pairs can walk through. And he's walking through and I'm alongside him and I'm commenting. You know, and the roar of the crowd and my voice at full pell shouting as if I'm in a big stadium as he's walking by. And then we go on this tiny little bridge over the lake onto the lake and uh, onto the green. And you just think like, this is ridiculous. Like, this is like being on the pitch in, in a football match or whatever. But um so yeah th- those kind of things you'll never forget and and those are the moments that you you can't replicate you can't prepare for you can't you know th- there's no homework gets you in that position that that, that is a one off unique situation um and and definitely that something you'll never forget the rest of your life um i've got a, a question for one of our students that came through on twitter a little bit earlier i thought it was a bit cheeky but i'll leave mm. it up to you but he was just saying what's it like to comment on a ma- major tournament when your team or your country isn't there yeah, look, this is a big thing. And I, I said this right to you at the very start of my first answer today. So uh, people are always intrigued and there's always questions to this effect because because people love sports so much and because most of the reason most people watch sport is because they have a team and they really enjoy when that team does well and maybe they suffer when the team doesn't go badly. But their their association with the team, whatever the sport, whatever they're in, that's one of the main reasons they tune in. It's different for me. It's my job. I think the easiest way to compare it is like a referee. You know, a referee shouldn't really care which team wins, doesn't care which team wins. What they want is to be involved in big events. If you're a referee, you want to referee the FA Cup final. You want to do the World Cup final. Those would be your ambitions. Now, it's not like, if, if, oh, yeah, no, actually, I just prefer my team to win. No, like, they, you know, they want to be there at the big events. And it's more of a selfish thing to you. You want to be part of a big game. So, you know, if I'm doing, and you pick any team here, any big team, Chelsea, Manchester United, Liverpool, whoever, if I'm doing them in the FA Cup and they're playing against a third or fourth division team, I would love the third or fourth division team to win. Of course I would, because because that is a that is something that will make people stop in their tracks. You know, if you're getting your car, you turn on the radio and you hear Man City are 1-0 down to Newport or something, you go, whoa, hang on, I need to listen to this. What's happening here? Whereas if you tune in and Man City are 3-0 up on Newport, you go, yeah, yeah, whatever, I don't need to listen to this. So you want something that grabs the attention and therefore, that neutrality isn't a problem. And, and as I'm kind of laboring the point a bit here, but I think 
people don't see this. They, they think, oh, you, you know, you must only want, or it must be great for you when it's a vested interest. And it's not. You know, if, if I'm doing a Republic of Ireland game and if a Republic of Ireland player falls in the penalty area but he wasn't fouled, I'm not going to scream penalty. Now, if I'm a supporter in the stand, I might well do. If I'm with my friends and I've had a few beers, you go, oh, ref, that's, oh, that's got to be a penalty. You know, But that's not what my job is. My job is to say, well, what actually did happen? Um, and, and it's a more sober view. It's a more detached view while still being engaged. Um, but it doesn't matter to me. And, and, and genuinely, you know, if, if, if my if the choice for me was to do Republic of Ireland in a group game against Estonia or to do Brazil against France in a in a World Cup final, I want the World Cup final, you know, because that's a, that's a more higher prestigious thing for me. So, yeah, look, in a perfect world, I want Republic of Ireland in that final, but um, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> And when when you're at a game, um, what are you looking for from a co-commentator? Who, or who is the best that you've worked with? You know, the one who is able to complement what you bring um, as you go through the game. Yeah, I think I think look, it's a very interesting partnership, and and like anything in life, you know, it's people playing off each other. You can you can have someone who's very good, or you could be good at something, and it's it, it's who brings the best out of each other. Um, I think, and again, there's, there's there's different requirements, radio and TV, different requirements, different sport. You, you want someone who's got authority, who's got knowledge, um, who who can give a, a context to what's happened. I mean, I, I often think mistake commentators make too much sometimes because we get to go to so many games and, and we feel that we've got a bit of knowledge about the game that we then portray our opinions a little bit too much. And at the end of the day, I don't think so. I think the commentator's job is, is to describe what has happened. And then it's the summarizer's job to give the context to say why that matters, to say what they should have done differently, etc. Um, so you know, it's the, 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 there is a partnership to it, and I'll give you an example of sort of what you want as a commentator is that you know, if a game is beginning to come to life, it might have been a bit flat, but it's beginning to liven up now, and you as a commentator get a bit more energy in your voice. If your co-commentator is still down and a bit flat that doesn't work you know so you want someone who'll come with you on the journey when, when when the excitement comes and look if it's a poor game you have to say it's a poor game and i'm not saying you've got to fake that sort of excitement but but you want that enthusiasm you want someone who wants to be there and and, and is good about it and then and then there's different you know horses for courses if it's a if it's a mid-table league game that doesn't have a huge amount riding on it you want a guy who's who's good and has nice little stories and anecdotes and funny things that happened in their career and stuff like that who can have a bit of a laugh about it and that's brilliant but if it's if it's the FA Cup final you don't want that you know the, the game itself is too important and you don't want those other little anecdote stuff so it's particular people for particular games um look I've I've been so lucky throughout my career to work with so many great summarizers I remember early on in my career I worked a lot with Mark Lawrenson and that was such a big boost to me because he was a you know famous guy who obviously was a great player and won all the big trophies but he was also in those days he was on match today every saturday night so he was sort of very well respected and renowned and famous and the fact that i thought i was working with him on a regular basis made me feel well this is great i must be i must be doing something high profile too um i've always enjoyed working with chris waddle i think he's one of the funniest people i've ever met he's a great storyteller great voice great enthusiasm for the game great great knowledge for the game um, and then in, a lot in, in more recent years, I was working with Kevin Kilban, who's, who's Irish like myself, and um, did a lot of games with him. And we always had a great time in terms of you know sharing that enthusiasm of the game and, and obviously the, the social side of, 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 of working together on the road and all that. So we, we've become really good, good pals for that through. So, so yeah, it's it, di- different people for different events. Um, but it is nice as well to always, you know, go back to what I said earlier about using different parts of your brain. It's nice to use... You know, sometimes you've older, more experienced people. Sometimes you've younger people who maybe have have a knowledge of what it's like in a modern dressing room and might have played against the players who are on the pitch in front. So they've got very different styles. And sometimes guys who've only just retired are a bit cagey because they don't want to be seen to be criticizing people. Whereas if they're retired many, many years, it's kind of water off a duck's back. So different requirements, but having different people keeps you fresh, I think. And just on on a similar kind of vein, when you were kind of developing your career, who were the commentators um, that you thought I want? I want to pick up some of this. I want. I want to replicate some of what they're able to do. What What were the best bits of commentary you remember as you were going through? Ah, uh, yeah. Look, I mean, I think I think as a kid, you know, the, the all of the sort of frontline commentators you, you'd have taken bits from, and you respect them for 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 the experience they have and the the opportunities that they've been able to get for themselves. You know that that doesn't happen by accident. So I think anyone who's who's you know forefront of a terrestrial broadcaster is a good commentator to start with. I always thought Barry Davis was fantastic. And I think I think a lot of people share that view. He didn't seem to try too hard. He didn't seem to show off. Um, 
and I think I think those are attributes that that people are jealous of because it's as easy as it is to say that it's it's difficult. You know, you want to do a good job, you want people to like you. You know, these are natural human instincts, and I think people have got to be careful not to not to push a bit too hard and not to try too hard because I, I don't think people like it. You know, when when someone's blatantly doing that. Um, in Ireland, where I grew up, you know, the Gaelic sports are very popular. Uh, Gaelic football and and hurling, and there was a, a commentator called Michal Mirahertig who did his commentary into a great age, and he had a fantastic voice in the radio, and he used to go 100 miles an hour, uh, but he used to group, give great, what's the word, um, onomatopoeia, you know, he, he would he would use a word that would describe, the, you know, the thump and the thud of the ball, and the tigerish of the tackle, and the whip of the pass, and all this, and I used to think he was brilliant, you know, the how he kept going, it, it sounded like he was breathing through his ears, that he would just, not, one long sentence that never ended, um, but I used to love listening to him. And, you know, in my mind as a kid growing up, that's what a commentator is. You know, it sounds like they're kicking every ball. Um, so, yeah, he would have been a big hero of mine growing up. I remember the racing commentator, Peter O'Sullivan, again, a bit like Barry Davis, a guy who just read a class about him. Uh, you know, you, you'd imagine his feathers would never be ruffled. Um, and I remember meeting him actually when I was starting out, I was really 20, 21 years of age. I just started doing a few commentaries and I met him. And I always remember a bit of advice he gave to me was, he, he said, Connor, it's 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 1% inspiration. It's 99% perspiration. And it goes back to what I said before, you know, doing your work in advance is what allows you to be that relaxed broadcaster on air. And if you're scrambling around trying to confirm stats or look up things or double check things when you're live, you're going to sound flustered and and that's what you want to avoid. So yeah, I always remember that that piece of advice he gave to me and you kind of think, well, if, if someone of his caliber still has to work really hard, um, it just shows, you know, you can never coast. You can never think, oh, I've made it now. I don't need to try anymore. And just one f- last one for me before uh, we we'll go to Darren in the room. Um, how did you end up on Squashbuckle? Mm-hmm. Yeah, very, very big part of things. For people who don't know, Squashbuckle is a, a program on uh, CBBC. So it's uh, children's TV. Uh, and, and CBBC actually Swashbuckle is. I, I do Jamie Johnson, which is on CBBC. Um, so CBBC is the very young kids, preschool kids, and um, there's a mm-hmm. pirate show uh, called Swashbuckle. So the the guy who devised the program, John Hancock, he, as far as I know, they they tried to get an actor to be the voice. That there's this parrot character who sort of narrates, commentates, if you like, on the activities that the kids are doing in the show. And I think they tried to get an actor in, and you know, it just sounded like he was reading a line or he didn't have the energy. And then I think one day he was driving in his car and he, he heard me doing a football commentary. He thought, that, that's the kind of energy, that's the excitement in a voice I want to get. So he he contacted BBC Sport and got you know got my contact details and whatnot. But I've been doing that a long time now. And I, I'm always surprised every year when they ring up and they, you know, we're making another series of this. And, you want to, and I was thinking, like, this is bad because surely the kids who are, you know, three or four or five years of age now weren't born for the, you know, you could just show the old shows again, but they keep making new ones. And it's, uh, it seems to be very popular. They've sold it all over the world. It's won, you know, kids BAFTA awards and all kinds of things. So it's been a great thing to be part of. And, you know, very much what I spoke before, but using a different part of your brain. I mean, that's I, I, for people who don't know, you know, I, I literally squawk like a parrot. That's what I do in the in the show. So it's uh, it's very the, the one thing I'll say about it is, is you've got to be very careful. We're recording a series at the moment. Um, you, you damage your voice doing it because I do this, you know, playing today. We've got Connor. And it's a squeaky voice, which. When you've done that for a few hours, actually, you'd be right. If you do a football game the next day, you'd end up a bit croaky. So I've got to be careful. <laughs> really, thank you. All right, we're going to get some uh, questions now from the uh, room. Can we? Uh, can you hear this microphone? Okay, Connor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cheers. Okay, so uh, if anyone's got a question, Paul's already taken my swashbuckle question. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to come up here uh, now. What's your question for Connor? Um. So. I believe your first radio commentary for BBC Radio 5 was in April 2002 when you covered Bolton versus uh, Tottenham Hotspur. Can you can you put into words how you felt before and during that game? That's a that's a very uh, journalist question there now. I like that, getting into details <laughs> and the stats along the way. Um, no, I remember that game being, being very nervous because I'd obviously done commentaries before in Ireland on terrestrial TV and... Uh, and radio and um, but this is my first game on the bbc and you kind of go oh, you know I, I need to put on my posh phone voice here and i need to i need to have everything right here um and i remember being very nervous and uh the the co-commentator that day was paul mcgrath who was a legendary player played for man united and villa and, and republic of ireland and i wouldn't be surprised like they they probably team me up with paul to kind of make me feel comfortable oh you know another irish guy and whatever um and paul is a, as a brilliant and i can't stress enough how brilliant a player he was 
Um, but as he himself would would acknowledge and everyone else, you know, he's a very softly spoken, laid back, you know, gentle giant of a guy. Um, and again, that that was a nice sort of introduction. It wasn't like I was with some, you know, guy who was going to be all in, you know, Billy Big Boots or whatnot. So, um, yeah, I remember being really, really nervous. I can remember so little about the game. I mean, it's it's 20 years ago, which makes me feel very old. Um, but I remember just feeling, yeah, great. I'm up and going now. I've, you know, it's funny, like I laugh. I look back then what I thought was all the right work I was doing, you know, over the years I've honed it and um, I, I would do it very differently nowadays. But I think at the time I felt, yeah, good. Got through that. Still alive. Haven't messed up. You know, that wasn't a disaster. Um, these kind of thoughts come through your head and, uh, and yeah, and, and then you're up and going and, you know, and I always say to people and, and people who are, you know, trainee journalists or whatever, who want to get into this, you know, once you've done one, then you're not the trainee anymore. You, you know, you're not a wannabe. You can say, I've done it. I am a football commentator. And um, that confidence gives you, gives you great belief because, you know, there isn't an, you know, there's no core, you know, driver's license you can do that you're then, oh, now you're qualified to be a football commentator. I mean, that doesn't exist. You, you've got to just do it yourself and make it work. Um, so yeah, I remember driving with the same later feeling, okay, that, that went okay. That went okay. Mind you, I'd hate to listen back to it now. I'd probably think it was terrible. <laughs> Okay, next question we've got is from James. Hi, Hannah. Um, when a game, a football game or a rugby game becomes flat and you can sense that around the stadium, as a commentator, do you feel like you, you have an obligation to breathe life, as it were, through your commentator? Yeah, but it's it's absolutely, but it's get the balance right. So what people don't want is they can see it's a rubbish flat game and you're getting all excited. And they go, well, this guy is just... You know, he, he's creating fiction here. You know, you, so you've got to be relevant. Thing. I think what it is, is it's, it's time for a gear change. If there's a flat spell in the game, it's when you either bring up a discussion about something else. Um, and, you know, just, you know, for example, for you, we're doing a game on Five Live. The producers the day before send you a list of, you know, other things to promote and trail. And you, you'll know this from listening to games yourself where, you know, be it television or radio, where they'll just break off. And, and they don't do this at a very exciting... This doesn't happen when there's a corner, right? This is when there's that flat moment in the game you've just described where they'll go, don't forget, you know, Super Sunday tomorrow, we've got the four o'clock game and it's Leeds against Leicester, you know, whatever it is. Those are the times to bring that in. Or, you know, check out BBC Sounds where the Match of the Day Top 10 podcast this week features Michael Richards and whoever, you know. So these are, these are little things that just give you that gear change. And then if you need it, you can have a little laugh off the back about that or you can ask your co-commentator a question about the thing. And it, it just sort of refreshes, recycles, and then you can go again, right, play back underway here. And it's like a fresh start. So you haven't just been this monotony of following a, a slow progressing game. So yeah, gear change, I think, is the word I would use. Um, and you'll notice this across, you know, this, this isn't unique to, to sports commentary. This is anything. If you, you listen to a, a news program and say they've been dealing with someone who's died and they have to speak in a somber, you know, this person has died in this life and it's a sad story. But then the next story might be a feel good story. Now, how do you how do you make that transition? How do you just go from the real this is this is terrible news to suddenly, oh, you know, and finally, here's a funny thing. And it's little things that you, you'll notice radio presenters will stuff this. So they'll say, right, well, it's Monday. It's 14.32. And it's, you know, don't forget coming up. The next program is this. is You know, so it's a little gear change. So they've talked about something else to distract, to kind of bring it all back to a neutral area. And then they go again with a new thing. So these are all mechanics, technical things that you learn as a broadcaster. And, and, and it becomes second nature to the point that you don't think about it. You know, it becomes, right, I, I just need a gear change here. And you're able to do that, to slip through uh, and go on. But yeah, look, I, I think you have an obligation as a, as a commentator to, to try your best to convey the excitement. Um, and I, I think an example I'll give you, if, uh, you know, if you, I'm sure you'll be, you, you'll know examples of this where, you know, the, the, the cameras are live on the stadium and the commentators talk about the teams haven't come out yet. So you're sort of building that atmosphere and that's great. But if it goes on a bit too long, you know, you're kind of, come on, now we need to get going here. And I heard a commentator recently doing something, you know, literally saying that, you know, well, we're just, just waiting for the teams to come out here. I was like, no, come on, be better than that. This, you know, look, these these tens of thousands of people have showed up here. This means something. Put that in common. Why does, you know, why is today a special event? Why, what are they hoping is going to happen here? What are the questions we're going to get answered? And and, and to set that agenda and, you know, have, have the confidence in yourself to be able to do that. I think that's, that's what you do, you know. So it's not trying to, what's the expression, you know, create a silk purse out of a sow's ear. It's, it's not trying to pretend the game is a classic when it's not. But but you know, reminding people of what's on what you know what's on the line here, what's at stake. These are the kind of things that you can do, which uh, which liven up something if it's gone flat. Okay, we've got a question now from Sam. Hey, Connor, what do you say is the best football match you've ever commentated on? 
Yeah, it's it's so difficult because over the years, you know, so many and, and you can have the really high profile games or you can have games that weren't really high profile, but were just very exciting games. You know, I've done some some really high scoring games. I find it difficult to to pinpoint, you know, the thing. I mean, I mentioned that golf, that Medina. I mean, that was probably the most ridiculous sporting thing ever where they, they you know, no team had ever been that far behind before and come back to win and Europe did. And, you know, that felt that, oh, yeah, people are going to remember, even if they remember nothing else, they'll remember the score of this game. Um, but yeah, like I think for me, little things like my first FA Cup final, I commentated on my first Champions League final, I commentated on first Rugby World Cup, final, you know, the firsts are kind of things you often remember. Um, but then, you know, little things pop in your mind. I remember there was a League Cup game and it was West Ham against Everton and it went to penalties and Adrian, who's now the Liverpool goalkeeper, was in goal for West Ham. And it was one of those where the penalty shootout went right through everyone. You know, they, they kept either scoring or missing and it came down to the goalkeepers had to do one. And, and Adrian had made a save and then he was the goalkeeper who had to go up and then take the next kick. And I remember as a commentator, I just noticed that he took off his gloves because obviously you know, it's the goalkeeper and he's wearing different kits to the outfield players and he took off his gloves. And I remember thinking that was a real symbolic thing because you don't have to take your gloves off to take a penalty. But the thing was, if he scored this penalty, that was it. The shootout was over. And I remember saying in the commentary, oh, he's taken off his gloves. He hopes he doesn't need them anymore. And then he scores it. And of course, he didn't need the gloves because the game was over then. And just little moments like that where I, I remember sort of feeling, oh, good, you know, I've nailed that, that I spotted that little thing. And that, you know, that became a big you know, focus point of the game. So little things like that you'll you'll remember. But I mean, I'm I'm so so fortunate. I I, I work at you know well over a hundred games a year. Um, so you put that over twenty over twenty years. That's that's a hell of a lot of games that I've been at. So it it, it is difficult to pinpoint certain things. But little moments like that I'll always remember. Uh, hi, Connor. Um, I've Hello. got a, hi, I've got a couple of questions. So the first one is um, has kind of the introduction of VAR changed your approach to commentary or was there a lot of uh, preparation you had to do before it was kind of introduced in the first game um and then the second question is kind of unrelated but whilst i've got the mic i thought i'd ask it <laughs> yeah. um, is when you uh speak to managers for example obviously managers are known for being a bit interesting characters you could say um do you have kind of different approaches depending on the manager you're speaking to and kind of like, what's the best way to build up a good rapport with different people? For example, I can imagine a, a Jurgen Klopp and a Jose Mourinho are two very different different characters. Sure, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I feel like Boris Johnson at the, uh, the the COVID briefing now. I'm going to forget the second half of the question. So remind me if I do. So the first on, on VAR. Okay, yes, lots of prep and homework because you at the start needed to understand it, and I think it took a lot of people a long time to understand it. I think there was frustration for certain people who who sort of put the head down and read about it and understood it, uh, got very frustrated that everyone else hadn't been able to keep up at the beginning. And you know, there was a lot of stupid questions asked about VAR for a while. Um, I think I think in terms of real play, and I'll, I'll give yesterday's game as an example. So I was at Ellen Road yesterday for Match of the Day, and Adamola Luckman scored a goal, which you know seemed to be a perfectly fine goal. Now, there is a temptation nowadays as a commentator that you don't go to the full, oh, he's won the game. He, that's, you know, that's his first goal of the season that you kind of, you could say, oh, he's going to hope that this goal stands, you know, and I I think my decision that I've kind of made is that you you treat the moment as it is, you know, at the moment, unless the flag goes up with the referee, you know, the, so just, just to explain, you know, if a goal goes in, the things that can stop it is that, the, you know, the flag can be up straight away and then it would still be viewed by VAR, could still be given, but the on-field decision is offside, if you like, or else there's a situation where the flag doesn't go up, the whistle doesn't blow, with it. the on-field officials have said that's a goal, but then VAR gets involved. So I think when it's a situation where the on-field officials have said it's a goal, I treat it that it is a goal. Now, you know in the back of your head it could get changed, but I think it spoils that moment. You know, the whole stadium is going crazy. People are celebrating. If you are the only person going, oh, I don't know, hang on, blah, blah, blah. Now, unless, and this is a case, you know, if you just feel, I'm certain they've missed a handball here or something and it's going to be called off, but... You know, to take the goal from yesterday, it was a, it was a hair's breadth of a distance. It's a tiny margin. So at the time, I'm giving that is a goal, and give it. You know, your we sort of say that the bit of commentary for archive is celebration. He's the hero. Then you come back and you reset. Well, hang on, they're going to do a VAR view, and here it is. We go through the replays and you see it. So 
it upsets people. There's no doubt. If you've done a great commentary where you feel, I've absolutely nailed that, I've captured the atmosphere, I've described it perfectly, but now the bloody goal doesn't count. You know, that's a frustration as a commentator. I think some of the older generation of commentators dislike VAR for that reason, or else they they feel, oh, I don't want to kind of embarrass myself by going through the whole screaming and shouting how great it is to be, to be then told it wasn't a goal. But I think I think you've just got to have the view. You know, you you, you deal with the moment as it is a moment. So at the time, you you describe it as if it's a great goal, and then afterwards you you review it and you you dissect it and you you get to the bottom of why it's been disallowed. But it is it is difficult. I think I think VAR look football is all about the emotion of it, the excitement of it, the big moments, and VAR just brings in more of those moments. I, I, it's really frustrating when it's your team, but like if you take yesterday's scenes, so Leicester thought they'd gone two and up at the end. Leeds have played really well in the game. The Leeds fans, when that goal was disallowed, they celebrated that as loud as if it was a goal for themselves. You can't say it's taken the emotion out of the game. It absolutely is. But I I understand it frustrates people. And it is definitely a work in progress. I think the technology will improve and get better. And in a few years' time, we'll we'll all feel a bit better about it. But it's, yeah, undoubtedly, it's a new element in the game. But what I think is you've got to work with it. It's boring. If you just come on and complain about VR all the time, that's been done now. You know, write an article on a Monday complaining about VR. But in the here and the now, when the ball goes into the back of the net, go with it is is my sort of view um i do remember the second question which was which is about treating managers differently yeah look everyone is different you know yesterday marcelo bielsa doesn't do his, his interviews in english he's very downbeat he doesn't even look at you i mean he looks down at his shoes as he's doing the interview and it's 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 difficult to to get good lines out of him but i think what you've got to do is is, is think about your questions in advance you know think what you know how, how can i get a reaction and to be really clear when i say reaction i don't mean a, to how do i provoke him here it's not that. It's it's you know how can I speak about something that he's going to want to speak about, um, and and I think you apply that to a lot of a lot of interviews with, with a lot of managers. The first question is great. You just go, what did you think of that? You know, it's not about showing off your knowledge. It's not about you know, well, Jurgen, you had more shots in the first half than they did, and I'm going to impress you with the stat I have, and then you'll tell me that I'm correct. You know that that's not what the question should be about. The, you know, it, it's about getting a good answer. And particularly that kind of match of the day answer, because they, they will occasionally use one or two of our questions, but that's not what it's there for. You know, it's there for a clip. You know, you're trying to get a good sound bite. So give them enough rope to, to do that. You know, don't just have a great point that they're going to say yes to. Um, so, so think about it. What, what What is the talking point that's going to get them? So like yesterday, my first question, Brendan Rodgers, was about that disallowed goal. You know, that's something he's going to feel passionate about. So here you go, Brendan, here's the microphone. You know, you, you tell me what you think. Um, and then for some guys, they can be very monosyllabic. Um, and you feel that your your questions are very long, and they're giving you short answers, and you got you got to deal with that. I've had a few, you know, over the years situations. I mean, I can tell you, but Jose Mourinho one time very upset at my opening question where Manchester United had drawn at West Brom, and I, I the, my question, which I, and I'll totally appreciate, I, I possibly could have you know worded a bit better, but I was trying to sort of give him the, the stage. But I just said it was two teams who cancelled each other out because it was one one, and he didn't like this idea of cancelling. You know, he, he thought that I was sort of saying that you know, the two teams were only as good as each other and all this sort of stuff. And uh, he was not happy with it. And he was, you know, what do you think? What do you think? And he's back at me. And it spooks you a bit because he's Jose Mourinho. He's a really famous guy. He's a very powerful guy. And you find, oh my God, I wasn't ready for this. And I wasn't prepared for this. And you find yourself backtracking a little bit. Um, and again, that 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 all gives you good experience. And when that happens to you the first time, you're, you're really spooked. You can you can roll into your shell a little bit. But you got to be confident. you got, well, hang on a minute. Now, don't, you know, if this guy's been unreasonable with me, you can you can put it back on them a little bit. Um, but it's trusting yourself and being brave and, and standing your ground. And, and at the same time, not getting into a fight with them because that's not, I mean, no one wants, you know, that, that, that would just be for your own ego. You know, no, no one wants to see you have a fight with it. You know, I say all that, of course, these are the kind of things that go viral on social media. But, you know, you, you, you want to keep your, your moral high ground and stuff. But be strong, be firm. If what you've said is reasonable, it's 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 okay to, to bounce it back. And you got to realize these guys have just come off the field of battle themselves their their adrenaline is pumped you know they're in there for 90 minutes they've been shouting every decision against them so so they're naturally a bit like that but yeah different guys different styles and uh yeah i definitely think you know thinking about your questions beforehand this goes for any interview is, is very important and it's not about i want to show off that i've an uh intelligent question it's not that it's, it's what's going to get me the best answer you know so look at it from that point of view uh, we've got a question off of YouTube. Uh, what are the major differences from commentating on different sports? Um, yeah, look, it's it's terminology and it's it's the rules and I you know the best example. So this weekend I did I did rugby for Amazon and I did football for Match of the Day and the kind of thing that 
you've got to be really careful of is if a, if a, if someone gets sent off with the rugby, they're not down to ten men. You know, they're down to fourteen. You know, and these are the little things that that, that you've got to be careful about. Um, in rugby and football as well, it's it's always meters in rugby. So twenty-two meter drop goal, five meters in from the touchline, five meter scrum, the ten meter line. It's all meters. Uh, in football, it, we always say yards. You know, eighteen yard line, ten yards outside the penalty area. Um, you know, he's pumped that 60, 70 yards. So just those little terminologies. And it's, I think it's the kind of thing sometimes we, we sort of laugh and you, you might hear a clip of an American commentator and they'll use just a slightly different terminology than we would. And, um, and, and people will, will sort of mock that or, 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 you know, if you use the incorrect terminology, people think that you're not at the races. So it's about having, having those, those right words. And, and again, that's just developing the flow and experience. And, and again, you can worry about it a bit too much. Um, but those would be the big things. And, and again, same applies to golf. You know, it's, it's, it's feet, feet and yards. You don't really say meters in golf. So these are, the, these are little things, but there's terminologies between the two sports that, that you use. And, and one thing which will be totally fine to say in football just won't be in rugby. So it's, it's been comfortable with that. And, and, you know, it's funny, actually, I, I don't think about it much, which I think is a good thing. You know, it just, not, okay, here I am today, I'm at a rugby game. This is, this is what these parameters are. Um, and probably if you did think about it too much, you'd, you'd make the mistake more often. But yeah, preparation again, that's what it's all about. I think we're just about out of time. Any final questions at all from the room here? If you've got it, throw up your hand. Uh, okay, well, just need to say thank you very much. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Conor McNamara. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's been really good to talk to you and, and best of luck with all, all your endeavours. Wonderful stuff. Thank you so much, Connor. I really appreciate your time and for doing a little bit of the parrot voice as well. Very, very happy about that this <laughs> afternoon. Uh, thanks very much, Connor. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, guys. All the best. Thanks to Paul. Cheers. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks very much uh, for this session. We're going to be back in around about 15.